It's like a movie you've seen about a million times, a story you've told over and over again to your friends. I don't do that, <laughs> but other people. Even like a favorite book you've read until the pages are worn. You know every line, every turn in the plot, every key sentence. Or it's like the neighborhood where you grew up. You know the houses, the streets, every fast food place. Even as the years pass and the businesses change, you still know the contours and shape of the landscape. It's like your favorite meal at your favorite restaurant. You know how each bite is going to taste. You know how it smells, the feeling of the food, the crunch or the softness, how it feels as you swallow. That's what familiarity is. That's what it means to be familiar. And for every Christian, that is our experience with the mercies of God. God's mercies are so familiar to us that we know exactly what to expect. Like that familiar story or the place you, you grew up or your favorite food. How is it then that knowing the mercies of God as we do, that we often forget to pray, we often forget to praise the Lord for his mercies. When we're struggling with a problem at work and we've just messed something up, it's going to take a miracle. But then that's exactly what happens, and we're surprised. Or we have a horrible meeting with the doctor. It's not at all what we had hoped it would be. It's going to take a miracle, and that's exactly what happens. And then we're surprised. Or we're working through some difficulties in our family, kind of being dysfunctional, aren't we? It's going to take a miracle, but then that's exactly what happens, and we're surprised. What did Jeremiah say? Remember his famous words as he's looking at Jerusalem, all the sin, all the rejection of God. And then he remarks one morning as he rises from bed, it is only of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed every morning. They're new. God is so faithful. So it doesn't matter what we're experiencing. It could be problems with our finances or difficulty in parenting our children or, or even a personal health crisis, aging parents, a recent downturn of some kind. And in those moments, we're tempted to wonder about God. But it is then that we remind ourselves that God's mercies have not changed. Every morning we wake up and we should recognize that his mercies, well, they have brought us safe thus far and grace will lead us home. In this psalm, we have our psalmist reflecting on the mercies of God to Israel. And even though the people had failed the Lord, he was still being faithful to them. And so the writer begins with God's goodness and ends on a note of praise. So when we reflect on God, this is how we should respond. So consider first, our God is good. He has always been good to us. You see that in verse 1, praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, because he's good. This is a call to worship by the psalmist. He says outright, God is good. He's a good God. He cares for us with his steadfast love, his mercies which endure forever, which he's demonstrated over and over again in his mighty works. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Can you name them all? Can you say them all by one by one? And of course, naturally, this turns to prayer. Verse 4, remember me, O Lord. The psalmist desires God to remember him because God is gracious, the favor that you bear on your people. And it will result in three clear benefits. He says, I want to know the prosperity of your people to participate in the joy of your people and join them in praising you at all times. It's really quite amazing here that as the psalmist is reflecting on the goodness of God, his heart is being lifted up in praise. His mind is being elevated up as he says, this is how good God is. And now, Lord, remember me. Don't forget me, but remember me so that I may praise 
you. And then he gives us an example. And it's the one that's so familiar in the Psalms. It's like every psalmist picks the same one out of Jewish history. Everyone picks the Exodus and the Red Sea. He says, we have sinned with our fathers, committing iniquity, doing wickedly. How did they sin? They didn't understand the wonders of God in Egypt. They forgot. They remembered not the multitude of God's mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. I mean, stop for a minute. Remember, all of the plagues of Egypt. Finally, God, after all of those plagues, and Egypt is decimated, they come out of Egypt having plundered the Egyptian, all the gold and jewels and silver their neighbors had given them, and these treasure chests uh, of, of all of these precious things, and they're carrying it away, and they come to their first big obstacle, and they go, well, that's it. God did all of that, but this one's too big for God. And Moses says, oh, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. And he raises his staff and the sea parts. He saved them, verse 8, for his namesake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. So he rebuked the sea and it was dried up and led them through the depths as through wilderness, as through desert. He saved them from the hand of them that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. So they believed his words and sang his praise. So, so here's the whole psalm in a picture. When they were looking at God and they were and looking at their circumstances and saying, no way this works. And then God rescues them. And then they remember all that God can do. These people remember. And yet the psalmist is saying, we have forgotten this. We have forgotten that God is good. It is the very thing that we believe. It's the heart of our faith. It's the very thing that we worship with. It's the heart of our praise. But we forget this, that we've been rescued from bondage in no less a powerful way. We who were enslaved by sin, subject to God's wrath and judgment, Jesus, by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, led us out of our captivity, setting us free by the blood of his cross and giving us new life in his resurrection from the grave. And did we deserve any of this? No, but this is what God does because his mercies endure forever. And God's goodness all comes in spite of our own unworthiness. How do we know that God is good? Well, this leads us to our second point. Because his faithfulness stands in stark contrast to our own failures. This is the bulk of the psalm. The psalmist is contrasting now what he's just said about how great God is, how good he is. And now he's going to just repeat failure after failure after failure. And, and he personifies this. He, he personalizes it. He takes it as his own. Even though many of these failures, he wasn't even alive. It was hundreds of years before he took his first breath as a baby. He says, this is what we have done, just as our fathers did. And we have to admit, with the psalmist many times, we have failed the Lord. Well, how do we fail him? Because in our heart we think God is good, but he's not good enough. And the psalmist gives four examples of this. And beginning in verse 13, he talks about a people who are unhappy with God's provisions. In verses 13 through 15, they forgot his works, waited not for his counsel, but lusted in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And so God says, okay, I give you your request, but sent leanness to their soul. How is it easy it is to become contemptuous of the familiar? What is the saying? Familiarity breeds contempt. Instead of being grateful for God's blessings, we sometimes become dissatisfied with them. Tired of the same old house, tired of the same old car, tired of the same old wife. Not in my case. <laughs> Young wife. 
Tired of the same old husband? Tired of the same old kids? Tired of the same old job? Tired of the same old church? Same old chairs. And these are pretty old chairs. Tired of it. They become dissatisfied with God's provisions. Well, they did. And they groused because they didn't have more things or other things. They become discontent with God's plan, not just his provisions, verses 16 to 18. Dissatisfaction can include saying, God's will is not good enough for me. But God gives each of us our life plan in purpose. You have the story of Dathan and Abiram. And the earth opened and swelled up Dathan and Abiram, and then a fire was kindled in their company and burned up the wicked. And these people were envious of Moses. They wanted more than what they had. They wanted their way, not God's way. And in that story, we often link them together with Korah, but remember in the underlying sin of Dathan and Abiram, it was a political opponent. Korah was a religious opponent of Moses. He was Moses' cousin. He wanted to have the same authority as Moses, but on religious grounds. You were part of the same family, the same tribe. You should not be king, ruler or king, as it were, ruler over all these people. Let's pass around the leadership among our tribe. Uh, that was more of a religious thing, but Dathan and Abiram was a political thing. They were tired of God's given leadership to him, and they envied him. They were disgruntled with God's person, verse 19 through 23. That is God himself. They made a calf in Horeb. You remember the golden calf story when they took all of the treasures of Egypt and they poured it into a mold and came out with this beautiful, I'm sure, golden calf. And then Aaron said, these are your gods, O Israel, that led you out of Egypt. Here is your God. And they made the image of an incorruptible God to be like the image of corruptible man and birds and beasts and creeping things, Paul says in Romans 1. And they changed the glory of God into the similitude of an ox that eats grass. How often they became discontent and disgruntled with who God was. They didn't like being led by a God they couldn't see and couldn't touch. And in reality, the root of idolatry is a desire to control the God itself. And in this case, in making an idol and giving it credit for rescuing Egypt, they were cheapening God. And it was so bad that Moses had to stand in the breach between Israel and God to prevent the people from being destroyed. Finally, they were distrusting of God's promises. Verse 24 through 27 they despise the pleasant land. All this coming out of Egypt and, and coming through Sinai and going through the Red Sea and the desert in, in about 18 months of time, all this to arrive at the cusp of the promised land and then turn away because they did not believe his words. This is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is going to say. They entered not at the end of chapter 3 because of their unbelief. But instead, they murmured in their tents and hearkened not to the voice of the Lord. And so God lifted up his hand against them and overthrew them in the wilderness. It's terrible to see when they forsook God's command and didn't trust God's promises to lead them into Canaan. They feared the people of the land and unwilling to obey the Lord's instructions, turned back at the very place where they would have received a blessing, an incomparable blessing. And instead, they went back to their tents, their own homes, and in their kitchens, and in their living rooms, and in their bedrooms, they complained against the God of heaven. You see, God is good, but he's just not good enough. Well, there's a second problem here. Not only did they say that God is good, but not good enough. The psalmist says, they sinned by saying God is good, but the world is is better. And he gives three examples here, beginning in verse 28, they join themselves to Baal Peor. That is, they wanted to be part of the world, and the Baal of Peor was the god of the Moabites. This is the story of Balaam. You remember that story? He'd been uh, paid by Balak 
to uh, curse Israel, but he kept blessing Israel. And, and it isn't until later that we learn actually what happens here when Balaam gives Balak the secret of how you can get the Israelites to fall, and that is to entice them to intermarry, entice them to become part of their world. And so the women of the land were enticing the men to sin, which led them into idolatry. And in fact, when one man of Israel had taken a Moabitess into his own tent to commit sin with her, it is Phinehas who took a javelin in his hand and was commended for all eternity, commended because he killed the two wicked people. And that incredible story demonstrates the problem of wanting to be part of this world. To have what the other people have, to be part of this, this creation, the worldly mindset, this age, and not to be separate from it. Second, they desire to have worldly things, verse 32 and 33. And this is a story from Numbers 20 where the people needed water. Well, you need water to survive. But God had provided water for them up to this point. All of a sudden, God's not going to provide water for you any longer. And they complained that God was not providing for them what they needed. And so their desire was to have this created thing. And finally, they copied the lifestyle of the world in verse 34 to 43. This is the final example which comes later in Israel's history. Remember, here's the sin of Joshua. They do not conquer the whole land. They don't kick everybody out of the land. With the Gibeonites, they enslave them because of a false and, and uh, a wrong promise to them. And because they do not kick out all the people of the land, th there is a slow encroaching of these people upon Israel until Israel and the people of the land look functionally the same. And by the time you get to Isaiah's day and Jeremiah's day, you find that the people and the princes and the priests and the prophets are all sinful. They're all wicked. They've all turned against God. So there's none righteous, not one, of all the people of the land. They're practicing the awful rituals of the nation around them, including child sacrifice, as gruesome as that can be. You see, they become so worldly-minded, so worldly-natured, that they were actually following in the wicked practices of the world. Yes, the sin of, of Israel was to say God is good, but not good enough. That God was good, but the world was better. But do you know what's amazing here? The psalmist turns in verse 44 and he says, nevertheless. Nevertheless, one of the most blessed words in our Bible, that even as we have failed him in saying he's not good enough, that the world is better, even in that God still is faithful to us. He regarded their affliction and heard their cry and remembered his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies and made them to be pitied of all those that carried them captive. This is what happens when we fail to truly trust and behold our, the goodness of our God and we sin against him because of our own unbelief, because of the weakness of, of faith in our own hearts, we come to the throne of grace, Hebrews says. That's the failing at the end of chapter 4 of Hebrews. It's not behavioral failing. It's belief failing. I'm, I trust you, Lord, but help my unbelief because I still have vestiges of faithlessness, of distrust in my heart. And so I come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Because I know when I come to God, he never ignores my cry for help. He never fails to hear my prayer, my plea. God, help me. How awful. The preacher who has said that God will not hear the prayer of his people if they have sin in their life. Do you, is there ever a day you don't have sin in your life? Is there ever a moment you don't have sin in your life? If you say yes, you don't know yourself. Paul says, even when I would do good, evil is present with me. And so, yes, David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But read the next verse. But verily, God has heard me and has not turned away his ear from the voice of my prayer. Those who regard iniquity in their hearts 
if you read the Psalms and understand the theology of Psalms, those are unbelievers. David is simply saying, we're an unbeliever, God wouldn't hear me. But because I'm a believer, because I'm a one of his people, because I'm one of his children, God always hears my cry for help. Always. What father among us doesn't hear the cry of his own son for help? Oh, yeah. Children can do stupid things. You know that because you were a child. You did stupid things. Children do dumb things sometimes. They get themselves in all sorts of trouble, all sorts of messes. Mom and dad have to step in to help. That's what God does. Yes, there are times I looked at my own son and said, you're so smart and so dumb at the same time. I can't figure this out. How is this possible? That you're so bright and intelligent, and yet you can do the dumbest things. And even as I'm uttering those words to him, you know what's ringing in my ears? My own father saying to me, you are so bright. How can you be so dumb? My dad used to say to me, son, you'll either be something or you'll be in jail. I can't figure out which. Well, I haven't gone to jail yet. God, does, God doesn't ignore our pleas for help. He considers our needs. He remembers us. He remembers his relationship with us. I'm your father. You're my son. You're my daughter. And he makes things better even when we deserve much, much worse. Oh, yeah. It's a stark contrast, isn't it? You take a, an old diamond, and it's roughed, and it's in the earth still, covered in clay. It looks a lot like the dirt around it. You go over that park in, in Arkansas. You just start looking for those diamonds. They're there. People find them every year. Some of them are quite large. You get to keep them, by the way. That'd be a fun missions trip. <laughs> and building fund at the same time. All those diamonds are in the earth. And they look just like every other old rock. But take it and polish it. Shine it up. Put it on a black piece of velvet. Shine a light on it. And the contrast is amazing. And the sparkle is blinding. And when you look at how wicked we can be, and you look at how faithful God is, you just have to stand back and go, man, God is good. So how should we respond? Knowing that God is this good and knowing that even when we fail him, he's faithful, we must depend on him. We must respond by dependence on him, upon his mercies to get us through these challenges of life. So that when we are in difficulty, we pray for God's rescue when life gets hard. Save us, O Lord, verse 47. We've come back to the beginning of the psalm again. We have another prayer. Just as he said, remember us, Lord, and save us. Now he's saying, save us, God, and gather us from the heathen. A call for God's help in difficult times when exiled to the far regions of the earth and scattered among the pagan nations of the world. He says, save us, Lord. This is a prayer of rescue, a prayer of salvation. This is the man bobbing in the water in the middle of a giant ocean, seeing his rescuers and is now waving his arms, save me, rescue me. This is what he's praying to God. And we come to God in prayer. We come boldly to that throne in prayer. And saying, okay, I know you are good. And so regardless of whatever I'm going through, health problems and financial problems and problems at work, any career and problems with family, aging parents, disobedient children, all the problems that go along in marriages as the world is pulling us like that saltwater taffy down at the beach, pulling us and stretching us. And we feel like we're about to break. That's when we can go and say, I know of all the things of earth, nothing is good. But you're good. You're good. And so I will pray. I will come and I will burst down the doors of your throne room. 
and come to grace to find mercy. You don't come into that room saying, I deserve this. You come into that room saying, I don't deserve it. But, oh God, if, if you don't come to my help, I will not survive. I will not last. I don't know if you've ever had this prayer. Have mercy on me, Lord. You're, you're not a very good parent if you've never had that prayer with your children. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on my family. Have mercy on my kids. Have mercy on my church. Have mercy on us, Lord. And even as you're praying that prayer and you're thinking about God's goodness, how can you not praise him? For his blessings. Even before he provides us the help. He says, he says save me, O Lord, why, verse 47b, so I can give thanks to your name and triumph in your praise. So I can glory in your praise. I can revel in it. I can rejoice in it. I can sing the songs of praise. And here's the song. Blessed be God of Israel, the Lord, from everlasting to everlasting. And he calls on the congregation to say with him, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. The prayer turns to praise. This is the motive of the prayer, so that we can give God thanks, so we can glory in God's praise. It's the content of the praise, this benediction, that blessings would be on God, that this would be never ending. This is our song in heaven. This is our refrain in glory as we stand upon the new earth and we enter into the new Jerusalem. It will be glory to the lamb that was slain. Glory that he will receive honor and blessing and glory and majesty and praise. And why will we sing that? Because of all the mercies that he's given us and all the mercies that he will give us that are never ending, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. When you remember how good God is, how even when we have been unfaithful, he has never been unfaithful to us. How is it you cannot turn to him in prayer and exult about him in praise? Many years ago, I was sitting in a counseling class and I heard one of the most horrible stories that I think I've ever heard. It's not, it's not probably the worst, but it's, it's pretty bad. There was a, a Christian man who was going in for surgery this is, this is many years ago, an experimental laser surgery. And it was down between the rib cage and the belt in that fleshy region we all have, that soft underbelly, right? Where everything is important is all smooshed together. Don't ask me. I took biology. I don't remember where it all is, but it's there. You know, you got kidneys in there and all the other things. Yeah, It's all there. You know what I'm talking about. And in the middle of the surgery, the surgeon dropped the laser, just an accident. And it just cut through this man's insides. He awoke from surgery in excruciating, lifelong pain. He would never be the same. He spent the rest of his days on a hospital bed, praising the Lord for being so good to him. And the nurses and the doctors would look at him and say, how is it that you're so cheerful and so pleasant and so happy? Well, he would say, it's not because I'm such a great guy, but I have an awfully good God. Let's pray. Lord, Help us to remember your mercies today. To remember even in our difficulties and even in our suffering. You're so good. You never fail us. You never turn away from us.